have a, a well-select range of wines, not too many. You know, you want a list that's going to be functional and workable, not a list that's going to impress. If you go back to the 1960s, the French, the Portuguese, the Italians consumed more than 100 liters of wine annually per capita. And now they are all three around 40. So they have more than half their consumption. Well, coffee is a higher margin, but then wine is a, a higher average spend. So it sort of balances out in that respect. You've got to sell a lot of coffee to pay the rent and pay the team, whereas a few bottles of champagne and you're sorted for the night. Welcome back to the Fifth Wave podcast. I'm Jeffrey Young, editor-in-chief of coffee business magazine, Fifth Wave. Today, in the spirit of summer, we're going to be exploring the world of wine and its parallels to coffee. Although the first coffee consumption was recorded over 500 years ago, the earliest evidence of wine fermentation dates back more than 8,000 years. This may suggest the wine industry is far ahead of the curve compared to coffee. But is that really the case? By exploring these two worlds side by side, we aim to arm coffee shop operators and baristas with a better understanding of the wine market and for some to maximize the potential of wines in their business. We'll be speaking with Phil Barnett, sales manager at Le Cave de Pyrene, to understand the dramatic shifts in the consumption and production of wine in the past three or more decades. We'll hear from Robert Robinson, co-founder of Notes Coffee Roasters, to understand how his firm delivers a quality coffee offering during the day and an equally good wine experience by night. We're starting this exploration by getting a broad overview of these two industries by speaking with Morten Scholler, author of the book Coffee and Wine, Two Worlds Compared. Originally from Denmark, Morten spent most of his career working as an investment officer in European institutions while developing a keen interest in wine on the side. In his late 40s, Morton was asked to move to Geneva to take on the role of senior advisor at the International Trade Center, a UN division that supports developing countries to improve their exports. Coffee was a major focus of his 14 years at the ITC, and upon retiring, he decided to merge his two areas of interest, coffee and wine, and publish his impressive book. Welcome, Morton. Thanks a lot. So what are the similarities and parallels between coffee and wine? The book, which is 330 pages, uh, has around uh, 100 comparisons. And out of these, I would say a handful of them are really fundamental differences. The first real significant difference between the two sectors is that in coffee, the value chain is very long. You have a lot of people involved. Wine is completely different. It's one of the few products where everything happens in one place. You grow the grapes, you take them into the winery, uh, which is on the same place usually. You do all the processing, the fermentation. It takes time. You bottle it or pack it, whatever. So it's a very, very short value chain, completely different. A second fundamental difference is that if you look at quality, quality enhancement, for coffee, you have next to no possibilities of improving the quality. Once you've harvested and started processing your coffee, you can ruin it in many ways, treat it wrongly or place it together with something smelly or not sorted out, whatever. But you can't really lift the quality. On wine, completely different. You've got more than a dozen options of how you can improve the quality. Different technologies, and you can add sugar, you can take out sugar, you can add acids, you can take out acids. Next to no quality enhancement options for coffee, a lot for wine. Third comparison is the size of companies involved. In the coffee business, uh, you have in this long value chain, two main types of companies. You have the trading houses, big companies, usually not known by publics, but they do all the handling, the logistics, storage. And later on, in the importing countries, you have the roasters and the brands. Some of these companies are really huge and handle 
10 12% of the world's coffee. In the wine sector, well, there are big companies, but primarily in the US, but none of them have any more than 2 2.5% of the world's production of wine. Fourth element is sustainability standards. Big difference in the sense that coffee has arranged through this long value chain to agree on global standards for coffee. Same conditions worldwide, whether you talk organic, fair trade, or the 4C verification, whatever it is. It's the same worldwide for 60 countries. Wine, completely different. Every country has its own standards. They put the bar, if you like, as it fits themselves, and that goes for both the environmental and social elements. I think uh, wine could, could really learn something, copy and try to standardize, because each country, as I say, has its own. They have their color codes, which mean different things, and it's a label confusion. And on some of it, you are not really sure whether it's very strict or whether it's a light certification when you are confronted with those in, in the wine sector. And finally, a difference also which is significant, uh, that's related to blending. If you go to supermarkets in Europe, I would assume 80% of the coffee or somewhere in that magnitude are blends. This blending is in most cases done before the roasting. You blend in what you want to have, you roast, and you have your final product. Wine is completely different in the sense that you may have also blends two, three different types of grapes. You produce different types of wine through the fermentation, which takes two, three weeks. And then only at a late stage do you blend the wines. So blending first, and then roasting for coffee, and in the case of wine, fermentation first and blending. What are the implications for these differences in terms of how the coffee market versus the wine market operates? I can give you a couple of examples. Uh, if you go back to the 1970s, the Americans, 90% of the wine from the U.S. is produced in California, so that's where the research and everything happens. And the University of California in Davis developed some standardized sensory terminologies. And they also developed what they called the aroma wheel, this huge colorful wheel with a lot of terms inserted. This aroma wheel has been copied by the coffee sector. So in around late 1990s, a similar wheel came out and a lot of descriptions, a lot of terminology has been developed in the coffee sector, copying wine. Another area which has had implication for coffee in an almost similar way is point scoring. When you describe or when you rank or rate coffees, this also has its origin wine. It also goes back to the 70s, where again in America, the wine connoisseur and wine writer Robert Parker developed a scoring system with the possibility of scoring up to a hundred points based on quality. This became very popular in the US, used by a lot of professionals and gradually also used in uh, retail and appreciated by the consumers. In a similar way, coffee is also scored or ranked since the late 1990s maybe ask an obvious question, but the economics of the coffee industry appear to be so much worse for the coffee farmer than for the wine farmer. Is that fair to say? I wouldn't entirely agree on this because the wine producers are also challenged. It's correct. I mean, coffee farmers to a large extent are not paid very well. But it's been like that for more than 20 years I've dealt with coffee. Supply is too big, consumption growing, but uh, the two don't match up. You hear about these high prices and so on, on on wine, but a lot of wine farmers are also struggling. And on top of it, if we take Europe, where 65% of the world's wine is produced and consumed, 
with France, Italy, and Spain as the largest producers, consumption has dropped significantly. If you go back to the 1960s, the French, the Portuguese, the Italians consumed more than 100 liters of wine annually per capita. And now they are all three around 40. So they have more than half their consumption. So there is also on that side an, an, an overproduction and, and struggling. Let me add to this. I gave you the figures for Europe, because if you look at the world production and world consumption of wine, it's been very stable for 10, 15 years, but rescued, if you like, from the um, emerging markets, more and more consumption in Asia. So that has compensated for the loss in Europe. But that doesn't help the small farmer in the small vigneron in France or in Italy. A lot of uh, wine grown compared with 30, 40 years ago now in Chile, Argentina, South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, and not to forget China, just like coffee. Uh, China is now number 10 country for both coffee and wine production. Thanks so much for joining us here today, Morton, on Fifth Wave. You are most welcome. Thank you for taking time. I was surprised to hear that the specialty coffee industry had actually borrowed some of its key assessment tools from the world of wine, including the famous coffee flavour wheel and tasting score sheets. And a very interesting point Morton made is that wine consumption has actually fallen dramatically in wine's most mature markets, down to just 40% of what it used to be in Italy and France. And it seems that both the coffee and wine sectors are eyeing China as the next major market for both consumption and production. Next up, we're speaking with Phil Barnett, sales manager at Le Cave de Pirenne, a UK importer and distributor of wines from around the world. Phil has seen the UK wine market develop over the last three to four decades and speaks about the shifting consumer trends that have underpinned the rise of craft coffee and beer markets also. Delighted to be here today with Phil Barnett from Le Cave de Pirene. Thank you very much, Jeff. I wonder if you could give us a, a, just a bit of background on how the wine industry has evolved you know, over the last couple of decades. I think maybe going back a little bit further, because my, my involvement has been since the mid-80s when I was working in restaurants. And I think then wine was very much a drink that was drunk in the restaurant environment, or it was drunk in the home environment, but only by a very limited amount of people. And I think wine was considered to be slightly a, quote, posh drink. And then it really wasn't accessible. I mean, I remember when I first started going into pubs that I'd go in and have a, if I was with a girlfriend, I'd order myself a pint of beer and for my girlfriend, a gin and tonic or something like that. But there was no wine available. And in a lot of restaurants, the selection was was poor. And then in the 80s, There was a much greater influence of wine coming in from Europe, from France, from Germany, from Italy. And then in the 90s, we were flooded with inexpensive, good value Australian wine. And people then started drinking wine as an everyday drink. As people's interests have grown and importers have started to bring in wines from other countries, such as the Austrian market, Slovenia, Georgia, And then obviously a huge expansion in the new world. New Zealand, 40 years ago, did not have a vine. And now it has just expanded in a hugely, in an exponential way. And it just gives people a massive amount of choice. What does today's wine consumer look like? I start off by saying there is a market for everybody. There's a market for every consumer. But there are people that will go to the supermarket. They'll buy the wine that's on offer. And they're not maybe particularly concerned about where it's from, what it is, as long as it's a wine that they enjoy at the price that they're paying. The demand has also meant extraordinary globalization, massive plantings throughout the world, and huge branding, a lot of dedication and loyalty to brands. But tied into this, I think there's another emerging wine drinking enthusiast who actually seeks different things. They want to have something with a greater degree of provenance. They want to explore it a little bit more and try to drink a healthier, less mechanized style of wine. This ties in somewhat with maybe with the craft beer market and I guess probably with the coffee market as well. So on that point of the healthy side, organic wines, is that a a major trend? It certainly is in coffee. 
I think organic, yes, organic is a major trend. That can go a little bit further to biodynamic, which is basically taking organic growing to another level where you have a much more holistic approach to the growing of the vines. The idea being basically that you don't take out any more that you're putting in. So it's nurturing the soil. And then also in the, in the winery itself, it's working with as little intervention as you can manage. So you only ferment with a natural yeast. You try not to filter the wine. You try not to tamper with the wine. And you try to add as little, or in some cases, no sulfur as a preservative to the wine. So is that what we call natural wines these days? That is exactly what we call natural wine, yeah. And is that the same as biodynamic? Uh, bi it is an extension of that, that a wine can be organic without necessarily being natural. So you can have wine that's made from organic grapes, but then if you don't treat it in a, in a low intervention way in the winery, it slightly falls down on, on what's called the natural scale. So what about the hospitality and restaurant sector? How has wine changed in terms of what's being served and consumed in, in restaurants? I think that's quite a, a layered situation at the moment. You've got what I call fine dining. Fine dining is, is the world of sommeliers, the world of very formal service, the world of people not speaking very loudly, wine being poured with a certain amount of reverence and everything. And a lot of extraordinarily good wine is served and sold in that environment. There are wines on certain menus in certain Michelin star establishments that are going for £40,000. And then you come down to what I call sort of middle range everyday dining, which is where a restaurant will probably have 15 or 20 wines on its list, a good selection, and the management team will know a certain amount about it, but they won't be sommeliers. Then you have what I think emerged over about the last 10, 12 years, which is the emergence of really informal, simple wine bars. And these were places where you could go in, a very convivial approach. A lot of them were fueled by the natural wine market. They started off in Paris. And in Italy, you have places called Enotecas as well, where you can just go in, and there's an enthusiastic guy standing behind the bar, what do you want to drink? What do you want? Well, try this. See if you like this. So there are lots of open bottles. You have a taste of this. You have a taste of that. It's a very informal, no frills approach, no pontificating, no snobbery. And this has been a way, I think, to bring different wines, unusual wines, and in particular, natural wines to the marketplace. And then the other one, of course, is the everyday wine that's served in pubs or in pizza chains, wherever it may be. That's just good value, everyday drinking wine. So what do you have to get right to get wine right in a, in a restaurant setting? You're asking me to give away the secrets of my job, Jeff. Um, <laughs> I think you've got to have a very good understanding of your customer base. I think you need to know what demographic is going to be walking in and what kind of wine they might want to drink. If your demographic is probably people over the age of, of 50, who live in a fairly well-to-do area, then there's no point in having a load of funky natural wines on the wine list because they simply won't understand it. So in that sort of area, you would have more traditional wines like a, a Chablis or a Sancerre or maybe some Chianti. However, if you're opening a restaurant in Hackney, then you certainly don't want those wines because nobody's going to drink them because they would be considered to be fusty, stuffy, and the kind of wines that my mum and dad would drink. So I think you've got to understand your demographic and have a, a well-select range of wines, not too many. You know, you want a list that's going to be functional and workable, not a list that's going to impress. And I think the other thing is just get your price points right and tie in the cost of your wine to the cost of your food. So I tend to work on a theory that your most expensive wine should probably be around twice the price of your most expensive main course. And then the cheapest? Cheapest, I think, is very much up to you. And I think it's just a question of assessing the people that are coming in and what you think they might want to spend and probably doing a little bit of a, a nose around the area to see what other places might be charging. How does an average good restaurant go about training their staff for wine? I think the ability to sell wine depends on the restaurant itself having a wine culture. And so if it doesn't come from the top, 
if there's no enthusiasm to understand the wine list and to want to embrace the wine list, then I don't think that'll permeate down to the staff beneath. But if you do have that culture, and if maybe every week you maybe pick a bottle of wine and taste it with the staff, enthuse them, demystify it, make them realize that wine is just a product, it's a drink. It's not, oh my God, it's wine, it's sophisticated. It, it, it's a drink for every day. And I think as long as you can get your staff to embrace that and appreciate it, then you can definitely get the message through to the customer. Wonderful. Phil, thanks for being here today. That's an absolute pleasure, Jeff. Thanks very much indeed. Wine's parallels with specialty coffee are plain to see. The growth of the natural biodynamic wine market, for instance, serves a newly engaged customer who is interested in wine provenance and eager to explore new flavors. These are the same trends that have underpinned the super specialty end of our industry. With Phil, we spoke a little bit about the different types of establishments that serve wine. So now let's speak with the owner of one such establishment. Robert Robertson is the co-founder of Notes Coffee Roasters, a chain of hospitality spaces that serve coffee during the day and wine at night. Robert began his journey in 2007-8 in Paris after finishing university and then moved to London to open a coffee kiosk. He and his partners opened their first Notes venue in 2010 and 11 years later, Notes has 12 locations across London. Of these, eight offer an evening service with wine as a central focus. Let's hear how Robert blends the world of coffee and wine in a single space. Delighted to be here today with Robert Robertson from Notes Coffee. Welcome. Hello, Jeffrey. Thank you so much for having me. It's a hard gig to get coffee open early in the morning, do the breakfast, the lunches, and then into the evening. So what made you, you know, want to take on that sort of gargantuan task of the whole day part? Yeah, well, I think like all of the best ideas in hospitality and retail more generally, it's led by customer demand. So when we were open in Theatreland, in that first site in St. Martin's Lane, just off Trafalgar Square, we had people who came in five, six o'clock before they went to the theatre. We were open with our um, siphon and our V60s and our Chemex, but really a lot of them wanted a glass of wine. And that's when we applied for a licence and began our journey with coffee during the day and brunch during the day moving on to wine and beer and cocktails and small plates in the evening. And I suppose we were nervous once we branched out away from the West End and theatre land with the alcohol side of the business thriving Canary Wharf in the city. And we found it really did. A lot of it was about people wanting somewhere more relaxed and a bit more sophisticated than the pub without going for a full restaurant meal. So, you know, from what we can see, it's very, very challenging to create a venue that has appeal in the day and then into the evening. What would you say are some of the the things you've learned along the way and how to sort of translate the offer throughout the day? Those basics of the lighting and the music and all those things that go into the atmosphere are really crucial. But I suppose as we built and designed more and more venues, we learned to work with our interior designer to really make that idea of a morning to evening venue built into the DNA and the fabric of the space so that it felt comfortable during the day. You didn't feel like you were having coffee in a pub or a bar. And in the evening, you didn't feel like you were having a glass of wine in a coffee shop, you know. And that is quite a difficult balance to get right. But lighting and music and candles and all these things go a long way. Also adjusting the service so that it's table service in the evenings and bar service during the day. That's an important part of signifying that, you know, it's a big difference. And one of the most satisfying things is when people come back in the evening and they say it feels like a completely different space. Certain things are important, like covering the fridge, which is quite, you know, daytime grab and go fridge. You don't want that staring at you when you're selecting your lovely bottle of red wine. The team... And the atmosphere that they create and the welcome they give our guests is so important at every stage of the day. And you don't want someone who's really passionate about wine, you know, being forced to get up at the crack of dawn and serve coffee if that's not what they love to do. So we do find that in our venues we have some overlap, but mostly different teams during the morning and the evening. The evening guys need to know how to make great coffee, but they have got a different sort of approach and maybe a different career history that gives them that knowledge of wine and that 
table service etiquette, which is slightly different to the coffee bar etiquette. But, you know, there are loads of great people at Notes who can do both. You guys are roasters and artisans and craftspeople around, you know, the whole coffee experience. How do you get that level of expertise in wine? I think early on we realised that we needed to get expertise. So one of our first really significant hires was a master of wine who advised us on that side of the business, not as a hire, but as a consultancy. So we got that expertise in. And then when we opened into the evenings at our second site, yeah, we recruited someone whose experience, he was Australian actually, was all about wine, although he was interested in coffee as well. So we, we realized early on we needed help with that. And then as we've gone along, we've invested in the evenings with someone who's role is in the business is just to look after the evenings and to find those great wines and make sure that the customer experience you know is really top notch and matches the standards that we set during the mornings and then from a business point of view so economically which which is the the most profitable if i'm really being sort of frank here well coffee is a higher margin but then wine is a a higher average spend. So it sort of balances out in that respect. You've got to sell a lot of coffee to pay the rent and pay the team, whereas a few bottles of champagne and you're sorted for the night. So both are important for us. You know, food has often been a, a compliment to coffee to kind of get that average spend up, but wine obviously helps to get sort of higher sales into your venue. What's the link between food and coffee, and food and wine. Yeah, I think food is really important. You know, both during the day, it's become more and more important for us as we've expanded our brunch menu. I think the market's gone that way where people really, early on, kind of a really good cup of coffee was enough. And now people, you know, want a proper brunch alongside that. During the evening, actually what's interesting for us is different locations are quite different. So in the city, after work, People are maybe less interested in food. They're happy to to have a few drinks and a few nibbles, whereas our locations in the West End, maybe theatre goers and tourists, they're more interested in the food in the evening. So those locations sell more food in in the evening and during the day, whereas the city is a bit more drinks-led, as we say. Wonderful. Thanks for being with us here today, Robert. Thanks so much for having me. It's interesting how small cues can signal so much to a customer. Table service compared to ordering at the bar, candles, and even covering up a fridge. And by hiring passionate wine-focused staff, he's able to awaken that passion within his customer base. And that's all this week for the Fifth Wave podcast. Please subscribe to Fifth Wave wherever you get your podcasts. And we'd really appreciate a good rating if you enjoyed this show. And also get in touch and tell us what topics are important to you so I can make the show more relevant to you and to your business. You can follow the link in the show notes to worldcoffeeportal.com slash fifth wave. This episode was recorded in the one and only Serendipity Studios in glorious Camden, North London. It was produced by myself, Jeffrey Young, the World Coffee Portal team, James Harper of Filter Productions, and sound engineering by Chris Brister. And in the spirit of summer... Today, we leave you with a song from the Coffee Music Project. Sit back with a glass of wine or a cup of coffee and enjoy Summer Night Vibes by Ellie Harris. I can see us in the summer Warm sea breeze and star cross lovers, bay. And I'm still on the comma But I'm thinking about no other, lay. I feel like I've known you longer than forever all I can say is that I don't know what to say It's deeper than the outer layer uh, Yeah, babe, there's something that's connected us within Summer night vibes Hold me to
my stare I know that there's something there Something I could really dare To delve into a sweat But this don't ever really happen I'm going with the flow I hope you know I'm liking it Summer night vibes Hold me to Garden to show all our story. Summer night. 